It is truly a blessing to be here with you. I've, I've been privileged to serve at First Baptist Mustang for 24 years, just the sweetest, greatest church, just an amazing honor and privilege for me. I, I represent them, uh, as I hope I represent the Lord with you today faithfully is my my goal. I recognize that this is one of the few churches where you can say that you have pastored a church for 24 years and people look at you and say, is, is that all? Um, but it is a, just an amazing honor of my life to have invested those years there and uh, just the, the, the greatest delight is to get to preach God's word to that sweet congregation every Sunday. But in God's kindness, He allows me opportunities like this that I do not take lightly. I do want you men to know that I I do love this seminary. I do love the work that takes place here. I'm thankful for it. I'm a product of it. I'm an absolute champion for everything that, that happens here. And my desire is today to invest in the seminary, I pray, by encouraging you. I do want you to know my heart as we open to Genesis chapter 20. It's, it's not my desire to try to uh, impress you. It's not my desire to try to even be memorable. It's simply my desire and my prayer today that I would be able to faithfully show you a clear picture of who our God is so that when you leave here today, you can be more in awe of Him and no less than that. I also recognize that in this room, and for others who are watching this, there are some brilliant minds. I don't pretend to be among the elite of that. I'm not here today because I'm smarter, or because I'm better, or because I'm more gifted. There's really only one reason you should listen to me today, and that's only this, if what I say to you comes from God's Word. It's not experience, it's not a degree, it's not a title that, that should allow me access to your heart and mind today. It's just one thing that, as the testimony shared earlier reminded us, I too am a sinner saved by grace. And the grace of Jesus Christ has changed me. And the grace of Jesus Christ is so transformative that I want you men to faithfully, for the rest of your lives, proclaim the truth of what the Lord can do for us. That's why I've come. That's my aim. I was able to meet a number of you before chapel. Those who I have not met, I would love to be able to meet you afterwards or around campus. Uh, If there's any way I can be an encouragement to you personally, it would be an honor for me to be able to do so. I'll be here next week for Shepherd's Conference as well. And if our paths cross, if there's a way that I can encourage you or pray with you, just know that it would sincerely be a desire of my heart to do that. I have one aim today and that is to magnify Christ by encouraging you through His Word. I pray that's what the Lord allows us to do. We come to Genesis 20. This is a passage of Scripture I suspect for most here we're familiar with. It can be a bit of a, of a bothersome passage because Abraham is a believer. He has faith in God's promise. We read of him in Hebrews 11 when it speaks of those who lived by faith. It speaks of his faith in Galatians 3. If you were to pick up your Bible and just read Genesis 1 through the end of the book, we would have read just a few pages earlier in chapter 15 that he believed the Lord and it was counted to him as righteousness. Words repeated in the New Testament, of course, in Romans chapter 4. He's a believer. He has faith. And yet that reality is what makes this chapter so hard to read. Genesis 12, of course, is the incredible covenant God made with Abraham when he was 75. That covenant's confirmed in chapter 15. It's reaffirmed in chapter 17. We now find ourselves in chapter 20. Some 25 years later, just about, Abraham and Sarah still find themselves waiting for God's promise to them to be fulfilled. And just as we have seen God's covenant 
stated and then repeated, so we sadly come to a place where we see Abraham's sin also repeated. Something very familiar in Genesis 20 is about to take place, something if we were reading just beginning to end, we would have just read about that happened a little earlier in his life. It's what one author called disobedience deja vu. That here is Abraham, a man of faith, and sometimes a man where we see such strong faith, and yet also at times, including our text today, we see him living out what frightened faith looks like. Look with me here in Genesis 20. From there, Abraham journeyed toward the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur, and he sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. And, but God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Now Abimelech had not approached her, so he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did not he himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart, in the innocence of my hands, I have done this. And then God said to him in the dream, yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart. And it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. I want to walk through this passage as well as the rest of the verses in this chapter. We'll do it with a few headings that I hope will serve not only to help us navigate this episode, but also by themselves help you to apply and remember and live out what I'd like you to know today. Number one, old sins return if they are not put away. Old sins return if they are not put away. The text reminds us in verses 1 and 2 that Abraham is on a journey. He heads south shortly after Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. He settles here in Gerar, just over the border from the promised land. It's a prosperous city, perhaps a place Abraham sees and thinks this would be a good place to conduct business. And in verse 2, Abraham said of his wife, Sarah, she is my sister. Sarah now in her 90s, Abraham afraid that the king will see Sarah and want her for his own. And the fear is, if the king wants Sarah for his own, then he may kill me to be able to make that happen. And if you were just reading Genesis 1 through Genesis 20, you would say, now, wait a minute, have we already read this? This sounds so familiar. Well, it's because he's repeating an old sin. The first time it happened, it was in Egypt, right after the promise had been given to him. Sarah was then 65. Nearly 25 years later, he does it again which just by itself reminds us, gentlemen, that no one is beyond temptation. You don't age out of temptation. You must be on guard all the time. Now, maybe we could understand, at least in some way, that Abraham fell into this temptation at the beginning. Not that it was good, not that it was right by any means, but maybe we could at least understand that things were new to him and he was young in his journey with the Lord. Maybe we could understand 25 years ago that out of fear, not that it was good or right, but, but we could see in a weak moment that someone could do this. But after all these years... After all that he's learned and after all that he has experienced, it just seems strange that someone who was such a hero of the faith and someone who was mentioned specifically for his faith multiple times in Scripture finds himself once again repeating old sins. It's probably worth noting that this happens during a time of transition in his life. 
perhaps a time when his life felt a bit upside down, and maybe new stress and new pressure has made him especially weak and vulnerable. It doesn't excuse anything he's done, but I do use that as a word of caution for you gentlemen that sometimes in our lives when pressure mounts, we can excuse our sin. Don't do that. When the demands of seminary life and the pressures of pastoring become really strong and you feel overwhelmed, it can be very tempting in those moments to let down your guard or to give in to temptation. After all, you're facing so much stress. Don't ever use that as an excuse, but do hear it as a caution. Old sins return if they are not put away. How does a man of such great faith so easily fall into the same sins? And I want to say to you gentlemen today, don't ever get comfortable with your sin. If you get comfortable with your sin, you will grow numb to its, to its dangers. And please hear me, you cannot cultivate a garden of holiness if you tolerate a section of sinful weeds. You've got to fight for holiness all the time in all areas of your life. Why does Abraham do this, though? I mean, God has already revealed himself to Abraham that he is El Shaddai, the the God with all the power, the God with all the might. And, And Abraham knew that. The problem here is, as one author put it, our doctrinal faith must become daily faith. Abraham knew who God was. In the same way, I suspect, gentlemen, when you are tempted and and you give in to sin, it's not because when you give in to sin that you have punted your view of the inerrancy of Scripture. When you sin, it's not because you now deny the deity of Christ. When you give in to temptation, it's not because you don't believe Christ was resurrected and that he's physically returning. You believe that. You know that. You understand that. It's doctrinal faith. But the doctrinal faith must work itself out in daily obedience. And it's possible even at seminary to devote time and attention to the rigor of scholarship and study and yet tolerate sin in your life. I plead with you, gentlemen, not to do that, not to take your sin lightly, because old sins do return if they're not put away. Genesis 15, 1, the Lord says, fear not, Abram, I am your shield. He had the Lord as his shield. And yet, in a moment of temptation, he fell. Verse 2 says, Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent men and took Sarah. Abimelech may be a title, may not be a proper name. Either way, he sees Abraham as a wealthy and powerful man and figures an alliance between the two of them would be a good strategic move. And so because of Abraham's sin, this takes place. Which leads us to a second reality, and that is that God's sovereignty is greater than we imagine. God's sovereignty is greater than we imagine. Look at verse 3. But God came to Abimelech in a dream of the night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is married. This is a true nightmare. Now, I don't know about you. I've got a couple of recurring nightmares in my life. Uh, I used to wait tables a long, long time ago. I waited tables for three years. And to this day, I will have a dream that I'm a waiter again, and I only have one table, and I can't get to them. And I'm trying to greet them and trying to bring them water, but in my dream, it's always the same thing. Somebody gets in my way, and I have to go do something, or the water spills. I just can't make my way there. I have another recurring nightmare. I just had this one last week, in fact. Um, I, I've been out of high school for 33 years, but I will still have a dream where I find myself in my high school and they say, Michael, you have a, a term paper due or you have a final exam. And I say, no, I'm, I'm an old man now. I, I've been out of school for years. I've graduated from here. I've gone to college. I've gone, I've gone to seminary. And they say, I'm sorry. I don't want to tell you. you. You've got to go take this final exam right now. I just had that dream last week. I suspect 
you'll have some seminary nightmares in the years to come as well. But I've not had any nightmare like this. I've not faced anything like we've just read about. God came to Abimelech in a dream and said, Behold, you are a dead man. That's a nightmare. And the the truth is that Abraham's cowardice and Abraham's lies have put Abimelech in a very precarious situation. As one theologian states that our sin has a wide net. Gentlemen, our sin does more damage than we know. It causes more problems and confusion than we realize. Our sin impacts more people more deeply than we'll ever fully understand. And yet, verse 3, but God came to Abimelech. God was still working and God was still moving. Why? Because God is more sovereign than we even imagine. Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, will you kill a nation even though blameless? Did he himself not say to me, she is my sister, and her, she herself said, he is my brother, and in the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I have done this. And can I just stop and, and make an observation here that the pagan king looks much better right here than the patriarch does. It's not unlike the book of Jonah where The Ninevite king is much more noble and seems much more likable than the prophet does. In the wrong moment, even God's people can look awfully weak. You've no doubt seen that. You've perhaps lived that. God said to him in the dream, yes, I know that in the integrity of your heart you have done this, and I also kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. God will not let his promise be ruined because God is more sovereign than we even imagine. God has struck Abimelech with an illness to keep him from having a relationship with Sarah. Now, it's essential that God does this because everything rests on God's promise to Abraham that he would have a son with Sarah. And as this story unfolds, it's essential that God God protects his promise this way because, just think of the the possibilities. If she is not already pregnant by Abraham, and she becomes pregnant by Abimelech, she won't be able to become pregnant by Abraham. But if she were to already be pregnant by Abraham, Abraham, perhaps that was the case and she didn't know, hypothetically, if that was the situation and she were to have a relationship with Abimelech, then she and no one else would ever know for certain, is this child the son of Abraham or Abimelech? So God sovereignly, providentially protects his own promise because his sovereign care is greater than we even imagine. Notice also, he says, I kept you from sinning against me. Even last night as I reread this passage, I thought to myself, I wonder how many times that's been true in my life. I wonder how many times in God's sovereign care he has protected me, prevented me. I wonder how many times God, through his sovereign care, has brought things into my way that felt like an annoyance or felt like a nuisance, but actually was God sovereignly providing for me. That phone call you received that came at the wrong time? That person who stopped by your office and you thought to yourself, not now. That trial that invaded your family's life and you thought this is the worst possible time remember gentlemen God is more sovereign than you even imagine and his sovereign care is always at work but the wording here is interesting it says I kept you from sinning against me this would have been Abimelech having a relationship with another man's wife 
wouldn't that be a sin against Abraham? The Lord makes it very clear that first and foremost, all sin is against him. We would do well to remember that because long before sin is a damage to man, it is a dishonor to God. And we ought to think of that. I kept you from sinning against me. That reminds me as a husband that my wife belongs to God more than she belongs to me. And any sin I would commit against her is first and foremost a sin against God, which ought to have a lot of impact on the way that I treat my wife and speak of my wife and react to my wife. Any sin I would commit against her is ultimately a sin against God. And the reason why I want to avoid sin in my marriage of any kind isn't just because it would make life miserable, isn't just because it would make our home full of conflict. It's more than that. It's a sin against God. And you may excuse your sin at times and think, well, this is, this is just between me and this person, or this is just between me and my boss, or this is just between me and my spouse. Listen, all sin is a sin against a holy God. And if you ever lose sight of that, you're on a dangerous path. Old sins return if they're not put away. God's sovereignty is greater than we imagine. And now we come to what may be my favorite verse in the episode, verse 7, where I want you to make note of a third thing. Our failures do not prohibit God's grace from being powerful through us. Our failures do not prohibit God's grace from being powerful through us. Look at verse 7. Now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you will live. Strangely enough, even though this is a very embarrassing episode for one of the Bible's heroes of the faith, here we find the very first time the term for prophet occurs in our Bible. The official role, of course, will be spelled out later in Deuteronomy 18, but here we find the term for the first time. The work of the prophet is to speak the truth of God. The work of the prophet is to tell of what is to come, and a part of the work of the prophet is to intercede for people. And in the midst of this disaster of Abraham's life here, verse 7 Return the man's wife, for he is a prophet. And the word prophet jumps off the page to me because of how God could have rightly spoken of Abraham here. He could have said, return the man's wife. Abraham's a deceiver. He could have said, return the man's wife. Abraham was a coward. He lied to you. He could have said, return the man's wife. He is weak. Return the man's wife. I'm sorry to tell you, he still dabbles in old sin. I mean, it stands to reason, at least in our minds, that God may want to distance himself from Abraham here and not claim him as one of his own. But no. He says, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet. He's still God's man. Unbelievably. God doesn't hear speak of Abraham as the sum of his failures. We have a God who is gracious, who is faithful even when we are faithless. Praise God that Our failures do not eliminate God's grace from still being powerful in our life. Now, we understand, gentlemen, as the Bible clearly teaches, that God's grace should never be a license to sin, should never be an excuse to sin. Should we sin more that grace may abound, by no means may it never be, Romans 6 reminds us. But do hear the sweet word of God here that Abraham is still his man. 
He's a prophet. Only by grace. The end of verse 7 is also something worth seeing. If you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. Even the pagan is subject to the authority of God. I mean, it makes sense to us to say Abraham is God's man. God has a covenant with Abraham. Of course, Abraham is subject to his authority. Of course he is. But listen, it's not just that. Even the pagan king here must be subject to God's authority. Which tells us why you should boldly preach the gospel and unashamedly call on people everywhere to repent. What authority do you have to call the person in your church who you've never met to repent? Here's the authority. God is sovereign over all. And he calls on all men to repent, and we proclaim that. That gives us boldness as we preach, boldness as we do evangelism one-on-one. This gives us boldness as we go around the world and take the gospel to the neighborhoods and to the nations. Everybody will ultimately be subject to the authority of God. Fourth, I want you to make note that even spiritual heroes are flawed. This one hurts, doesn't it, gentlemen? This hurts. Even spiritual heroes are flawed. Abimelech got up early in the morning, verse 8, and called his servants and told them all these things in their presence, and the people were greatly frightened. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us, and how have I sinned against you that you should have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? You have done to me things that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said to Abraham, what have you encountered that you have done this thing? I mean, imagine here the pagan king is confronting and rebuking the prophet of God. This feels totally backwards, doesn't it? Well, even spiritual heroes are flawed. And this would be a good time to remind you, brothers, that you never outgrow your need for daily dependence upon the Lord. If you try to navigate the waters of this life on your own, disaster is always right around the corner. You can't read enough books. You can't have enough degrees. You can't have enough years in ministry. You can't preach enough sermons. You can't write enough articles that you ever escape needing daily dependence upon the Lord. You gentlemen are becoming scholars, training to be pastors and missionaries. And those are wonderful things. But you're first and foremost a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. More than a title, more than a vocation, you're a Christian. Follow the Lord. Obey His Word. Do not think for one moment that you are going to get enough of an education or one day have enough experience that you no longer need to depend upon Him every single day. In fact, when you read Genesis 20, if your first thought is, how could somebody be so foolish, it may be that you've stopped recognizing your own sin in your own life because the truth of the matter is, though we wish this were not the case, how often is it true of us that we would have to say of our own soul, why did I do that again? Why did I give in to that temptation again? You can read the Bible and read someone else's sin and come away thinking, what is wrong with them? Or you can read of someone else's sin and it drive you in humility to your knees to say, God, have mercy on me. Texts like this should drive us to repentance. In this conversation that takes place between Abraham and Abimelech now, we see really three excuses that Abraham offers up. Excuse number one is in verse 11. Abraham said, well, because I thought, surely there is no fear of God in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. That's why I did it. 
That's why I lied. That's why I was deceitful, because I came into town, I looked around, and I just assumed everybody here has no fear of God. This is, this is a euphemism that he uses here to just refer to people without any kind of social moral standards. He just assumes the worst out of everybody that's here. You should have trusted in God's promise in Genesis 15 that I will be your shield and your very great reward. Instead, he sees the people, assumes the worst, and blames it on them. And I want to say to you, as has been well written before, Fear sin more than you fear suffering. This is the mistake Abraham made. He feared what the people could do to him more than he trusted the provision of God. He feared suffering that could come his way more than he feared the dishonor of sin. Excuse number two, verse 12, besides, she actually, did this verse is, is just, I mean, you, you read this, and you just kind of have to laugh because you have probably been caught before and you try to talk your way out of it and you sound something like this. Besides, she actually is my sister, the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she has become my wife. And I just picture Abimelech's head going 360 degrees around right here. What are you talking about? What's he doing? He's trying to get away by technicality. He's trying to hide behind semantics. She is his half-sister. However, his intention when he spoke to Abimelech was clearly to deceive. Clearly to deceive. And let me say to you, brothers, if you try to hide your sin or remove accountability for your sin by hiding behind words it leads to a miserable marriage and it leads to a ministry of nothing but conflict the right answer when you're wrong is to say I have sinned not to try to go back as some attorney in a courtroom trying to find some way that you can absolve yourself of these charges. That's fine in the courtroom. That's not your role as a believer. There's a third excuse he gives. He says, And it came about when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said to her, This is the kindness which you will show me everywhere we go. Say of me, He is my brother. Did you hear what his excuse is here? He says, I've done this for years. I don't know why you're so upset about this. This has been our strategy. This has been our pattern. We've done this for years. I don't know how many times he's done this. Scripture tells us about two. It's going to happen again in another chapter with another patriarch. It's a strange excuse, isn't it? This isn't that big of a deal. I've done this for years. Cheating on an exam, plagiarizing a paper, I've done this for years. That's not a confession, by the way. I'm just, <laughs> just want to make sure we're clear. When we think like that, when we say to ourselves, I've been doing this for years, what's the big deal? All we're showing is that our heart has grown numb to the damage and the dishonor of sin. And, gentlemen, is there, a, is there a little tinge here of blaming God? When God caused me to wonder? You know, it reminds me a little bit of Genesis 3 when Adam's excuse is the woman that what? You gave me. God, this is the life you've called me to. God, this is the place you've brought me to. God, this is what you've called me to be about, and that's why I've done this. When I read these words, I, I, I hear a bit of self-pity. And self-pity is fertile soil for all kinds of sin. 
And I'll tell you a profession that's got a lot of trouble with self-pity. The pastorate. My people don't love me like they should. They don't esteem me like they should. They don't know how hard I work. They don't understand how much I do for them. They don't understand how much behind the scenes things I do. I don't get paid enough. You know how much time I've spent in school. People have this much education, how much money they make. Self-pity is a dreadful place to live. And I plead with you, gentlemen, if you tend to give in to self-pity, stop. Don't blame God. Don't blame your professor. Don't blame your congregation. Don't blame your circumstances for your sin. Do recognize that even spiritual heroes are flawed. And if that's true for our heroes, we must pay careful attention to our own soul. One last lesson. In verses 14 to 18, we see that prayer is always the right response regardless of our condition. Prayer is always the right response regardless of our condition. Verse 14, Abimelech then took sheep and oxen and male and female servants and gave them to Abraham and returned his wife Sarah to him. And Abimelech said, Behold, my lane is before you. Settle wherever you please. You know what's interesting here? Abimelech is not impressed with Abraham, but he is impressed with Abraham's God. Sarah, to Sarah, he said, look, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. It is your vindication before all who are with you and before everyone you are cleared. He gives her 25 pounds of silver. And do you notice, at least the way I take the, the language here, a bit of sarcasm and a bit of a rebuke here. How does he refer to Abraham as her what? Her brother. Little subtle reminder, your husband thought so little of you, he was willing to put you in harm's way by deceiving me to say he's just your brother. I think a bit of a rebuke there, which reminds us just as a side note, gentlemen, don't ever let your ministry become an excuse to slight your wife. I've been married by God's grace 27 years, and it's the sweetest gift. It's the sweetest gift. Don't lose your wife on your path of ministry. Verse 18, the Lord had completely closed all the wombs to, of the household of Imelech because of Sarah. So what does Abraham do? Abraham prayed to God. Notice that. Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his female slaves. Now, there's a lot in this chapter to frustrate us about Abraham, but don't miss this. Abraham prays for Abimelech to have children. Why is that so noteworthy? What's the biggest frustration in Abraham's life? That he can't have a son with his wife, Sarah. And now Abraham... Prays for another man to receive the blessing he has longed for his entire life. Catch this, gentlemen. At this point, because of what Abraham has done, he has forfeited his right to preach to Abimelech. Abimelech does not want to hear Abraham's sermons nor his word studies. but he can pray for him. And there may be people in your life and they won't listen to your preaching. You invite them, but they won't come to your sermons. They won't attend your Bible studies. There are family members maybe who have written you off and want nothing to do with you and your God, but you can pray for them. And prayer is always the right response, no matter the circumstance. God still uses Abraham, even though he lied. He used Moses, 
even though he killed. He used David, even though he was unfaithful. He used Peter, even though he denied. And by God's grace, he uses us. Aren't you glad for his grace? Gentlemen, if you learn nothing else from Genesis 20, learn this. We must be men of prayer. Study is not a replacement for prayer. Experience is no substitute for prayer. We must be men of prayer. Let me just share one last thing in closing. When you read of Abraham, depending on the chapter, you can come away thinking, what a hero. Or you can think, what is this man doing? When you read about Moses, there are times you think, what a great leader. Other times you think, what are you doing? You read about Peter, you think, what a bold man. Or, depending on the chapter, there he goes again. And because we're sinners, we need a Savior. Amen? And the good news about our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is that He lived a perfect life and died for us. And when you look at Jesus in the wilderness being tempted, of course there are things we can learn from Him. Of course there are things we can emulate from that example. Things like know the Scripture, memorize the Scripture, quote the Scripture, Quote the scripture in context. There's all kinds of lessons we can learn there. But chief among them is to recognize that what's happening in the temptation of Jesus is that he stood where everybody else fell. Tempted and tried like us, yet without sin. Abraham was tempted. He fell. Moses sinned. David sinned. The prophets sinned. The apostles sinned. You and I have sinned, but in Christ, we look to the one, the author and perfecter of our faith, who stood faithful where we fell. So when you think of the sin in your life, it need not drive you to despair, but it drive you to Jesus. And when there's someone in your life and you think they won't hear me preach, you still have access to the throne of grace through prayer. Be faithful, gentlemen, to your calling. Lord, we thank you for your word and pray that you would use it today to give us encouragement, to give us grace, to give us courage to do what you have called us to do for the glory of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.